One of the most moving moments in the book of Ruth takes place on the road from Moab back to Bethlehem where Ruth pledges her love to Naomi and Naomi is in a bad place. She thinks she's lost everything. But as we're gonna see, that's not exactly the case. So Ruth, part two, from famine to fullness. Let's jump in. Hello friends. Hey, if you are anything like me, you were probably blown away by just how much information was in those first five verses of this story of Ruth. And if you watched episode one, Brad just did a fantastic job of unpacking that information and laying the groundwork for everything that's gonna come in the story. And I wanna start by just calling your attention back to this idea of acknowledging our famines. We wanna be the kind of people who are present to our pain, who are honest about the hard things that happen to us. Because of course we know that if you suppress, deny, sweep that stuff under the rug, it just has this nasty way of doubling back on us and starting to leak out in our lives in all kinds of unlovely ways. Um, in fact, uh, Richard Rohr has this quip that if we do not transform our pain, we'll transmit it in some form. It's like we have to deal with the pain because if we don't, the pain deals with us. So the question that I wanna ask in this episode really picks up with that very idea, and it's just this. If acknowledging our famines is the first step back towards fullness, well, what comes next? How do you begin to claw yourself back from a place of famine and futility to a place of fullness and flourishing? And what we're gonna see as we look through the rest of chapter one, are two drastically different responses to pain in Naomi and Ruth. So let's start with Naomi. In uh, Ruth chapter one, verses six and seven, Naomi is in Moab and she hears that God has remembered his people and he's given a harvest back in Bethlehem. So Naomi, who's lost so much, does what you would expect her to do. She makes the decision to go home. And so she starts this journey from Moab back to Bethlehem, but she has these two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, who've decided to make the journey with her. But somewhere on the road between Moab and Bethlehem, Naomi has this change of heart, this change of mind, and she turns to Orpah and Ruth and she says, go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. So there's this really tender scene on the road where these three women who love each other so much are holding each other and they're weeping. And it's beautiful, but it's also a little confusing. Why would Naomi, a woman who's lost her husband, her sons, her future, she has no one, but she does have these two girls who love her very much. Why in the world would she send them away. Now, there are a couple possible uh, reasons for why she might do that. And the first, I think, is that she probably knows her boys shouldn't have married Moabite women to begin with. In fact, uh, Robert Alter, who is a Hebrew scholar, writes this about Moabites. Readers should note that for biblical Israel, Moab is an extreme negative case of a foreign people. A perennial enemy its origins, according to Genesis 19, are in an act of incest. So Naomi knows bringing these girls home with me to Bethlehem is probably not going to reflect well on me. And there's this connection in the Israelite mind with Moabite women and sexual deviancy because in Genesis 19 with Lot and his daughters, the, the people of Moab find their origins in this action of incest. 
And you see this connection between Moabites and sexual deviancy carried on throughout the Torah. And Brad mentioned in the previous episode, this case in Numbers 25, where uh, Moabite women seduce Israelite men into sexual immorality and then idolatry. And then of course, Deuteronomy comes up with this prohibition about Ammonites and Moabites entering the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. So I think at one level, Naomi knows, oh man, if I show up at home and I've got these two Moabite women in tow, this is not gonna look good. Now there's also the possibility that Naomi knows that these Moabite girls, if they come back with her, they might not be treated well in Israel. So it's also possible that she's thinking about their well-being and sends them home as a way to provide a better future for them. But regardless of the reason she sends them home, what I want you to see in Naomi's response to her pain is just this, that evil often seeks to cut us off and convince us that we're alone. And in this moment when Naomi has lost so much, she still has two women who love her so much. But it's almost like she's focused on what she's lost, that she's completely oblivious to what we have, to what she has. And and I don't know why we do this as people, but when we experience some kind of pain, some kind of hardship, It's almost like our default setting as human beings is to focus on what we've lost and to completely shut our eyes to what we still have. And you get that sense that that she's acting this way with Orpah and with Ruth. And it almost feels too like she's pushing away the people who are trying to help. I know that as a parent, this is one of the most painful experiences. You love your child so much and you're trying to move close to them. And I don't know why this is. I don't know why we do this, but there is something about the brokenness and the fury of the human heart that in our thrashing and in our pain, we will often push away the very people who love us most and are there to help us. And and Naomi is doing that with these two girls who love her. And if you just kind of zoom out from chapter one and you look down and pick at random a couple of different phrases that you hear from Naomi, this is the the sort of thing that you start to hear. The Lord has turned against me. The Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. The Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has dealt harshly with me. The Almighty has brought calamity upon me. I mean, in just the span of a chapter, Naomi is giving God the business. And I actually don't know that there's anything particularly wrong with that. Because in the Hebrew scriptures, there's a whole tradition about lament, and that's another teaching for another time. But what I want you to see in these sentences from Naomi is the repetition of this word, me, me, me. There's so much me coming out of Naomi. And when we step back and just look at how does she respond to her pain, she is cutting herself off from the people in her life, and she is intensely focused on herself. And I think what you're seeing unfolding in her is something that Pastor Jeff Mannion at uh, Ada Bible Church in Ada, Michigan, says that first something dark happens to you. And then if you're not careful, something dark starts to happen in you. So Naomi's response to her pain is to cut herself off and to turn her focus inward. And even in the face of their protests, no, we're not leaving you, she insists. So they weep aloud and Orpah kisses her mother-in-law, but Ruth clings to her. So she says to Ruth, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Orpah kisses and Ruth clings. And here's where we see a dramatically different response to pain. Notice how Ruth responds to Naomi. She says this, 
do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. You can already hear in Ruth's response, there's less of a focus on me and more of a focus on you. Now keep in mind, Ruth has lost a husband. Ruth has been barren for 10 years. Ruth is leaving everything she knows, her country, her family, to come with Naomi back to a country that she doesn't know. But Naomi doesn't acknowledge that at all. But still Ruth responds like this. So there are three things that I really think are important to notice about Ruth's response. And the first is just that it is incredibly selfless. It is so selfless. And Brad, in the previous episode, walked us through how the book of Ruth is set in the time of the Judges. And when you look back into the book of Judges, you see this cycle. And if you had to capture in a phrase, what is the time of Judges like in the nation of Israel? In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. So in the land of Israel, it's all about me. Everybody's focused on their self-interest. But what's fascinating is if you zoom out of Israel onto a more global scale, the very same thing is happening. Uh, This is a time during the time of the judges that a number of scholars refer to as the age of nations. And so what happens during the age of nations is that all of these major empires who were the typical world superpowers, for some reason, they're all in a state of decline. They're all losing their power. And so what happens is they start to weaken. In the land of Israel, you have all of these smaller kingdoms that start to grow and start to strengthen. And they're fighting with each other for authority, for autonomy. They're flexing their muscles, trying to get access and control of these trade routes that run through the land of Israel. And so at a global scale, the world is also built around self-interest. Now, I know it's probably hard for you to imagine a culture that's built around self-interest, but that's what's going on. And what you've got to see with Ruth's response is that in a world of me, Ruth is about we. And her decision to remain with Naomi and come back to Bethlehem gets characterized in the story as this Hebrew word chesed. And if you say it right, you're probably going to spit on somebody near you. And and chesed means kindness, faithfulness, steadfast love, and actually a lot more words than that. It's a word that in English we don't have a great word for. In fact, in 1535, when Miles Coverdale translated the first English translation of the Bible, he had to coin a new word to try to capture the beauty of this Hebrew word chesed. And the word he chose was loving kindness. And loving kindness just means love as action, love as deed. It is covenant loyalty, covenant love. And chesed is actually at the heart of the Jewish vision of society, not based on self-interest, but based on self-sacrifice. So chesed is the kind of love that sees you at your worst, but chooses you anyways. Chesed is the kind of love that loves you even when you can't keep your end of the bargain and even when you don't bring anything to the table. Hesed is the kind of love that loves you not because you're good, but because the one who offers it is good. And this hesed, this loving kindness of Ruth, it will become the central theme of the story of Ruth. It becomes the thing that Ruth is most known for. 
Now, in Ruth chapter 1, Ruth's hesed is embodied, it's acted out through this action, this Hebrew word called davak, and it means to cling or to hold fast to or to be united to, right? Orpa kisses, but Ruth clings. Now, if you translate the word to cleave, some of you might be thinking, wait a second, to cleave, I, I know that word. A, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave or be united or cling to his wife. It's the same exact word. And this is why if you've been to a wedding before, you've probably heard Ruth's words used at a wedding ceremony because they're often used as marriage vows. So when you step back and you hold Naomi's response to her pain next to Ruth's response to her pain, what you see is that Naomi cuts herself off from other people, but Ruth is clinging to community. Now, I experienced this kind of clinging love in 2004, shortly after the death of my brother-in-law in Iraq. Uh, we had his funeral, and then just a couple of weeks later, my best friend got married. And so many of the same people who were at the funeral were also with us at the rehearsal dinner. And I'll never forget, after the rehearsal dinner was over, I was walking out of the sanctuary with one of the other groomsmen, and he turned and said to me, oh my gosh, what happened in that room? It is so dark and somber in there. And he didn't know what had happened in my family. And so I said, oh man, yeah. You know, my, my sister, she just lost her husband. They were only married for four months. She's actually in there. A lot of the people who were at the funeral, they're here at the wedding and you know, that's why. And as I was telling him the story, he did something that was so moving. He stopped walking and he reached up and he grabbed my arm and he looked me in the face. And then he let go of my arm and he walked a few more steps. And then he stopped and he grabbed my arm again and he looked me in the eye and his eyes started to well up with tears. And then he let go of my arm and he walked away. He never said anything. He just clung to me. But what he did in that moment was more healing for me than anything anybody else said in the aftermath of that loss. Because he clung to me. I think what we crave when we're in pain are a community of people who will come around us and just be witnesses to our pain. And so what I want to leave you with is just this idea from Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann. And he says this in a short film for the work of the people. He says, if we can get access to our pain in a community that we trust, our pain almost always is bearable because the trustworthiness of our brothers and sisters will hold and is reliable and will not let us fall through. Friends, that is what it looks like to respond to pain well. Don't cut off. Cling to the community that you have. So that's it. That is Ruth chapter one. This is part two of our series in Famine to Fullness. And I hope that it will challenge and inspire you this week to have new eyes, to be present to your own pain and the pain of others. May you walk out this text well in your life.